Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. This is The Savage Nation. Do you live for sex? Do you live for pleasure? Do you live for the most amount of pleasure you can get every day? Keep playing this song. What do you live for? Hey, you. You, lady, getting in and out of that taxi. Laughing at the Savage Nation in a taxi. You! You, the lawyer, just ripped someone off. You, stop for a minute. What do you live for? We are in a new place. You can turn off the music now because they can't hear me. We live in a new place now. America is now living in a new place. America is now living in a new age of nihilism. A level of nihilism that I have never seen in my lifetime. I mean, you can say who brought it about. You could say what did it. You know, left can say the right did it uh, with too much money in politics and too much preaching about morality. And the right can say it's the left because they're anti-American. The fact is we're living in a new age of nihilism. And I'm going to ask you a question today. What is your inspiration to go on? What keeps you going? Now, we know what people on Wall Street live for, which is profit. Just numbers, 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 numbers. That's probably what drives the largest percentage of Americans in business is profit, profit, profit. Numbers, 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 okay? We know that. But for the average person listening to this show, listening to talk radio, what are you listening to radio for? What are you watching television for? What are you seeking in entertainment? I mean, I can talk about Barbara Boxer being a very, very happy member of the Third Reich, defending the indefensible, which is the killing of living beings, calling it medical progress. I can talk about something uh, along the lines of uh, Louis Farrakhan giving a speech, which I'm not even going to play, where he said we must rise up and kill those who kill us, stalk them and kill them. Death is sweeter than watching us slaughter each other. There's a 400-year-old enemy, the Quran teaches. So he's quoting the Quran and calling for murder. He wants an army of 10,000 to go out and kill. And Obama does nothing. I can talk about that. I can get the newspapers in front of my eyes here in the Savage Nation, which I have. Actual, primitive newsprint that nobody seems to read anymore. San Francisco Chronicle, Rocky Fire jumps line at Highway 20. Revealing the power behind indirect lobbying, never talking about uh, the lobbying of the Democrat Party. Or the headline is The Daily Show, John Stewart's sharp, funny voice won't quickly be replaced. Now, this is in the heart of corruption, like you cannot see. This is Nancy Pelosi's backyard. This is Barbara Box's local newspaper. This is Diane China Feinstein's newspaper. They're taking the disgraced John Stewart, a well known government jester who reports directly to Obama's dictatorship and holding him up as a sharp-witted man. I could talk about the civilian deaths in Syria. I can talk about food. I can talk about China. I can talk about Africa. I can talk about climate and the climate uh, plans of Obama. We can talk about coal, uh, but we're not going to do that right now. Not ready for any of that. I want to talk about what is your inspiration to go on what keeps you going i'm asking the average american out there who lives paycheck to paycheck trying to pay the rent trying to keep an old car going trying to buy clothing trying to get dental work without really any dental plan do you live simply to live now once for those who listen to a show like this once it was the republican party before that it might have been the belief in the founding fathers or belief in the U.S. Constitution. Some believed in the conservative movement, which is long dead. Some believed in the church. Some believed in the synagogue. Some believed in religion. But today, so few believe in anything that I feel we're living in a new age of nihilism. So I ask myself, in an age of uh, medication, in an age where I see young white blonde mothers in the suburbs pushing their babies around in strollers, or whatever they call them, 
and the mother is on an iPhone pushing the baby around. The baby doesn't hear the mother except talking on an, on an iPhone. The baby can cry or squawk and the mother doesn't hear the baby. The baby is looking straight ahead and sees no mother. The, the baby feels no touching. That's the zombies that we're creating for the next generation, by the way. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just telling you I am an observer. My, my job is, is a social observer and a social commentator. That's all I do as a talk show host. Make no mistake about it. I am not a politician, unlike some in the media who confuse themselves with such. I'm not a politician. I never have been. I never will be. I am simply a social observer and a social commentator. So I'm observing today that we, are, we, are in a, we have a nation without any inspiration. We have no inspiring leaders, do we? Where, where's your inspiration? Where does your inspiration come from? Don't tell me it's the conservative movement. There is none. We know it's not the Republican Party. Put an X through that. So we come thou, down to hedonism. Hedonism seems to be a primary motivation in the United States of America. I was getting at this yesterday when I was comparing the West with Islam and why I think Islam will conquer the world, even though they're ninth century murderers, the fanatics who cut heads and set people alive, uh, a fire alive. They believe in something. They believe in hatred. They believe in murder. And to be honest with you, their belief in hatred and murder is more than we have in America. We believe in nothing. This country believes in nothing. And unless we understand that we have to believe in something, we're finished. We have become what uh, the great, I think the poet, I think uh, it was Yeats who wrote the straw man or the hollow man, I, I don't remember. The straw man, the hollow man, I should get that poem. The straw man, the hollow man, America's filled with straw men, retired white men who've done nothing in their lives, who walk around dazed in the streets, boasting that they're retired and they don't do anything. And they believe that that's the best thing they can be doing is doing nothing. They've worked all their life to do nothing. And they left a, a country in shambles. And so the rest of us, what do we do? Hedonism. Well, what is hedonism? You sort of know what it is. What does it mean? Hedonism argues that pleasure is the primary and most important intrinsic good. In other words, a hedonist strives to maximize net pleasure, to feel more pleasure than pain. What does that mean? Well, that's for most of it. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from a, a student of Socrates back in the ancient Greek, Greek days. And he held the idea that pleasure is the greatest good. And if you look through the history of civilization, you see that the word hedonism derives from the Greek word for delight. Pleasure, hedon, pleasure, pleasure. Something sweet. And if you look at the history of development, you can see the original Babylonian version of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And uh, that was written soon after the invention of writing. And in that, there was advice. Fill your belly day and night, make merry. Let days be full of joy. Dance and make music day and night. These things alone are the concern of men. Now, that's the first recorded advocacy of a hedonistic philosophy. The fanatical Muslims believe in the opposite. They believe in denying themselves any pleasure and killing those who enjoy anything on earth. And so in Africa, they mutilate their young girls so the girl can never feel sexual pleasure. I want you to understand what I'm saying to you. It's about as profound as you're going to get today. I'm not saying I'm the most profound guy on earth, but it's as profound as you're going to get today in the media. I can guarantee you. You're seeing two competing systems of thought, if you want to call fanatical Muslims thinking people. They are a death cult. They hate everybody, including fellow Muslims who enjoy a, a, a scintilla of life. And yet he, here in the West, we are their natural enemy. We live for joy. We live for pleasure. The liberal thinks that being joyful and having pleasure is the greatest good for the greatest uh, reason for living. That's what the liberal believes in, being delightful and being delighted. Now, some of us don't seek sexual gratification in our pursuit of hedonism, or shall I say, in being hedonist, we don't pursue it simply through the sexual. Some of us do it through food, and uh, they would be called epicures or epicureanism is the philosophy based on the teachings of Epicurus, founded around 307 BC to show you how far back it goes. And it's a materialism. And he believed uh, that the pleasure could be found in that way. The highest pleasure, the highest pleasure was tranquility and freedom from fear. And it was obtained not by Prozac, 
uh, not by Valium, not by alcohol, but by knowledge, friendship, and living in a virtuous and temperate life. And uh, Epicurus, I think his name was Epicurus. Yeah, Ep Epicurus, sorry, Epicurus, uh, lauded the enjoyment of simple pleasures, which he meant abstaining from bodily desires, abstaining from sex and appetites, and he verged on asceticism. So I don't want to go into all of these philosophies. You probably had this in College 101. There's another form of hedonism, which you probably never heard of, which is Christian hedonism. Did you ever hear of that one? Remember that was popular in the 80s, a Christian doctrine in some evangelical circles, particularly those in the Reformed evangelical circles, first coined by Reformed Baptist theologian John Piper in his 1986 book, which is that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him, or the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. And he asked, does Christian hedonism make a God out of pleasure? No, he says, it says that we all make a God out of what we take most pleasure in. So that's a theology, isn't it? Remember it was once considered Christian to make money? Remember that? That was popular for a while. Then there's another a philosophy, utilitarianism. And uh, there are others, which I have not to go into. So again, what am I babbling on about here? Why am I talking about this? Why am I not focused on Ted Cruz or Donald Trump? Why am I not focused on the debates that are coming up tomorrow, which is, oh, they're oh so important, where uh, Meat Loaf Jr., I, I told you he would be the snake in the grass. Didn't I tell you that? Did I not tell you yesterday that the Fox hosts who are going to hold this first big debate, uh, Martha Washington would pretend she's in the middle. She, she'd be clean as the driven snow. She's going to be neutral. Uh, I told you that Brett Baer is the only journalist. He'll ask a real question. I told you that the snake in the grass was Meatloaf Jr., uh, Chris Wallace, Wallachinsky's son, the meatloaf thrower. And today, Meatloaf Jr. dropped a bombshell saying he's going to have a fat, juicy hairball for Donald Trump. That's some journalism, uh, Wallachinsky. I mean, you're doing a great job. You know, your father would be turning over in his grave if he saw what you've become. But I'm not talking about it. It's boring. It's pedestrian. I can't do it anymore. Who cares about what Wallachinsky does or, or, uh, uh, or Martha Washington? I don't care about any of it. Maybe I've reached a point of no return in my own radio show in my own life. And so I'm asking you, the audience, to join the conversation. I have a feeling that I have the best stethoscope in the business. And I'm asking you if you feel the same thing that I do. You're lack, you have no inspiration. You have no reason to go on. Most Americans have no reason to live. Do you know that? You know, I know it's, it's harsh. So, yeah, well, wait a minute now. I have my family. I have my this. I have my that. What, what do you have? What do you have? Break it down for me. What is your inspiration to go on? And I want to read you something. The minute I come back, I've been working on a, de uh, a novel called The Detective. And it's an experimental novel. I've been working on it for nine months now. It's very short. And it's written with um, all sorts of odd uh, things in it, including uh, gender shifting, where you don't know whether the detective is a man or a woman. It's very hard to tell because it's not gender specific. And he himself projects confusion in the questions he asks. And I want to read you a paragraph from this experimental novel uh, and ask you, what is your inspiration? What keeps you going? Why do you continue to struggle? He realized to have want is to have something. To want nothing is to have nothing. And so he lived with his desire, feeling once again the desire for life itself. I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. You live to get high. You live to mock people. You live for a new pair of sneakers. Or you like Louis Farrakhan. You live to hate. Are you like Obama? Do you live to uh, hate people so much that you divide a nation that was so good to you? Or what do you live for? What is your MO, in other words? What's your motivation? To hurt people? To heal people? You go to an emergency room, you can see saints in the emergency room. 
I know it's popular to bash doctors, but go into an ER room in any big city and you will see saints at work taking smashed, broken bodies and saving most of them. They have a reason to get up every morning, don't they? And we used to have a military that had a reason to live until Obama gutted the military of, of all inspiration to survive, to, to protect the nation. This man is so destructive. You don't understand how evil, how powerful evil is. Many of you don't even understand how strong evil is. You look at him and see a skinny guy with weird ears. You don't know that he is pure malevolence. And he is so good at his malevolence that he has literally taken the heart out of America. He has, he has evaporated the inspiration for many people to go on. He has given people no reason to live. He has demoralized the entire nation with his enmity for this nation, especially towards white people. I know that you don't want to hear it and you know, it. yeah, it's not true. It is true. Oh, it is true. Everybody knows that. Everybody who really knows what's going on, knows what's coming out of this administration is pure racial hatred. I can give you one example after another. I can give you the latest one. They hired that flop Dick Gregory. Government money, black comedian Dick Gregory, U.S. federal agency. He delivers an anti-white racist tirade at a federal agency. It came out in a secret, uh, secret investigation by Judicial Watch. Paid for by the United States government. And he gave a speech, Dick Gregory, attacking white people with federal money to the cheers of the clapping black bureauc bureaucrats who hired him. It's rampant. It's like South Africa before the fall. That's what America has become under this administration. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. So Obama and his nihilism towards the greatness of America has destroyed the Republican Party, the conservative movement, the founding fathers, the U.S. Constitution, Congress, the church and religion, and many people who believed in this nation, who once believed in the political system, who once believed in a future, who once believed they would leave a better nation and a better world behind, have given up. This man is like the, uh, well, just leave it at that. And so people are saying, what, what are they supposed to do? They feel lost. So I'm asking another question today, which is what is your inspiration to go on having been detached from all of these other you know, possible constructs. What do, you, what do you do? What, do you have a good meal and a glass of wine? I mean, how, how many good glasses of wine can you have? And if you're young and you're in college, Animal House is your answer to a good life, right? Just have a good time. Parents say, you know, do what you want to do. You're only young once. And so you want to be with drunk girls, you want to vomit on yourself. Uh, you want to eat uh, hamburgers and french fries as though there's no relationship to your arterial system. You want to drink and get stoned. And you think that you're having a good time. You want to live by this degraded ethic of Animal House. Or you want to be a great lover like Casanova. Or you want to be a tough guy like Ernest Hemingway or Norman Mailer. Or, or like one of the idiot rap stars. But what are you really doing? I mean, what are you living for? Do you really think anyone's buying that act? What exactly are you doing? So you become what? You become something in life. Many of you think you're an artist. And so by being an artist, you think that by smearing garbage on a wall and being more outrageous than the other artists, you're gonna stand out. And maybe you'll stand out, but you, you, you in your heart know it's a con and that you're not an artist. You know you have no talent. You know you have no talent to be an artist because you have no discipline. And you can get away with it in your 20s, perhaps, and then you're going to have to get a real job. Or well, many of you think you're a writer. And if only the um, heathens, excuse me, if only the heathens who ran the publishing industry would see how great you are, uh, they would find out that you're the great American novelist. But in your heart of hearts, you know you can't write. You can't even get a job as an ad copywriter for a book company. You couldn't even get a job as an ad copywriter for a dog food company. But... Because you know that, you sit in your house or your cafe and you put on outfits and airs and you walk around like you're better than everybody. You use drugs, you get stoned, you get high, 
and you convince yourself that you're really a great writer. Now, one day you're going to come to understand that's not going to pay the rent. And then you're going to have to really do something with, you, with your life. So people are asking themselves who are older than the young, well, what should I live for? What's the point of going on? Well, I don't know. A really good restaurant? Oh, look at the restaurant that opened over there on the other side of town. I hear that their food is really good. I'll go there and enjoy a real Epicurean meal. Napa County. Napa County, San Francisco, real Epicurean delight, stepping over fecal matter in the street and putting up with bums who try to rob you or, or, or molest your wife in the street on the way to a fine meal. But, but forget the bums. I'm asking you what you're living for. Well, okay, none of you, some of you don't live for that. Some of you live to save the earth. Some of you live to um, abort babies. Your idea of salvation is to abort babies, to chop them up and sell body parts. And you convince yourself that you're doing something for, the, for humanity and, and the health of women. And then you become an insane old ha harridan like Barbara Boxer. Will you actually argue that it's about women's health to sell baby body parts? That's how insane you become if you keep that up. Or, well, you could fill it in, right? So I'm just asking you your views of what keeps you going on. I'm not trying to drive you mad. I'm not trying to drive you to suicide. <laughs> I'm just asking you and my audience, what is your inspiration? Because I'll be damned if I'm going to do what I hear on radio. I'm not going, I'm not committing suicide like the lemmings. I am not jumping over the cliff and doing this suicide mission that I hear going on in talk radio. I'm not doing it. If I have to talk about Republicans and Democrats for the rest of this year, I'll give up radio. I swear to God, I'll retire. That'll be it. I will not do it. I can't do it anymore. It's a disgrace. I mean, is Obama the sun, the moon, and the stars as evil as he is? As crackpot as he is, as powerful as he is, is he the sun, the moon, and the stars of the world? Isn't there a greater world out there? Do people live for any other reason other than to hate Obama? Or to love Obama? Or to believe in the fraud of global warming and work to save the earth when you know it's all about profiteering? You know in your heart of hearts it's all about ripping off the treasuries around the world. The church has been, the church has been ripped apart by this false pope. He was a bouncer in Argentina. They found a bouncer. Now he puts on the holy robes and marches around, and now he's an expert on climate. I love you people. You tell, oh, he's a pope, so he's holy. Well, before he was a pope, he was a priest. Before he was a priest, he was a bouncer. And uh, the president, oh, he's above discussion. Can't say a word about him. Well, before he was a president, he was an undistinguished and indistinguishable senator who no one even knew who he was. Before that, he was a college teacher. Before that, he was a community organizer. Before that, he was a college professor of some kind. Before that, he was a college student. Before that, he was a dope-smoking uh, high school student. So he was just a person like you and I. And now, why not? Because he puts on the airs of the presidency or he w walks in the president's office. He is above humanity or any president for that matter. Any president that's ever occupied the office was somehow better than the rest of us? Do you understand what I'm getting at? That we all have a commonality in our humanity? Yes, okay, so we all agree that we're all human beings. Wonderful. Well, are we all human beings? I'm not so sure of that anymore. You want me to get into something really weird? Well, it's a daytime show. I don't think I'm going to do it. I could get into the whole alien thing and talk about the man who fell to Earth. Many of you forgot that movie, 1976 British science fiction film directed by Nicholas Rogue, based on a 1963 novel of the same name by Walter Tevis. It's about an E.T. who crash lands on Earth seeking a way to ship water to his planet, which is suffering from a severe drought. Did you hear that? It's, it's performance is by David Bowie in his first starring film role. And the great actor of his time, Rip Torn. And the movie was pretty amazing. The Man Who Fell to Earth. And it was coming to my mind today. I told you I use intuition for my shows. And I kept asking myself, what is my inspiration? So I started with me. I said, what is my inspiration going to be going forward in radio? Because I can't do this the way it's being done. The ratings are crashing across America in talk radio. The, the others won't tell you that. I'll tell you that. It's, it's no secret. If you compare it to five years ago, it's very, very bad. People have tuned out. 
But the fact of the matter is, there's still an audience. And the question is, what is the audience tuning in for? What do they want to hear? I don't know, and I don't really care. All I care right now is about what I want to do on the radio every day, and whether you like it or not is your business. And so today, I got the newspapers. Paper, I never buy papers, so I get the New York Times and the Chronicle. And I was going to do the shtick I used to do. Flip the pages, laugh at the stories, tell you what's not in the newspapers that you know is really going on, and you'd have a good laugh. But I'm not even in the mood to do that, so I just wasted, let's see, a dollar fifty for this rag and I can't, two fifty for the New York Times. That's four dollars thrown in the garbage. And I don't even have a sick dog, and I don't have parakeets anymore. So I don't know what to do with the, the newsprint. Most of you don't read newspapers anymore. That's your inspiration, sit and read a newspaper? So what is your inspiration? What When you wake up in the morning, your eyes finally open, when you finally get yourself out of bed, if you're not working now. The country's filled with a lot of retired people. Do you know that, don't you? You know, we keep hearing there's only 50% of people don't work. Do you know how many people don't work who are retired on top of those who don't work? Who have worked all their lives just to do nothing? I could have retired 10, 15 years ago, maybe. I don't know. I never wanted to retire. To me, work is my salvation. Work, work, work is the only salvation. I got that from many sources. The work ethic was beaten into me as a child, came from an immigrant family, you've heard it all before. And work is a virtue unto itself. And then as I went on later in life, I read other things in college that inspired me. Eugene O'Neill, Long Day's Journey Into Night. The title alone was an inspiration. Long Day's Journey Into Night. Rodin, the sculptor, one of the great sculptors, I love to go see his work at the museum here. Great, great work. And what did he write? Work is the only salvation. It is the only salvation, which is what kept the great artists going until the last ounce of energy left their body, just to keep going. Now, I told you years ago that I found that one of my motivations was survival itself. Just survival kept me going. There was a time that I didn't think I could go on another day when everything had been taken away from me by this vicious liberal society. They stripped me of my birthhood they stripped me of my manhood. They stripped me of my very humanity by denying me what I worked for and told me that less qualified human beings would be given what I rightfully uh, was entitled to. You have young children, you can't make a living, you know what it does to you? You become pretty enraged. And when you become pretty enraged, you have a several different ways you can go. One, you can turn it inwards and become depressed because as you well know, depression is anger turned inward. Did you know that? If you can't get it out of you, you turn it in, you're going to get very sick. I didn't turn it in, I turned it out. And I went out and I created things with this, with this anger and rage. And here I am many years later in radio and all that, many books later. But I'm at another point again of asking myself, where is my inspiration to come from? What's going to keep me going? So I'm turning it on to you. Why, why do you keep working? What motivates you? You see, I'm not at the point where I was before, where I was driven by pure need for survival. You see, this is the big difference in my life right now. And maybe I'm sharing a little too much, but the fact is, is that I am so bored of politics, it's almost painful for me to watch it. I'm actually bored to the point of pain. I feel physical pain. The only one I can stand watching is Trump because at least he speaks the truth. And I believe he actually says what he believes. The rest, you can take them all and throw them all in the same category. I hear nothing coming out of the rest of them. It doesn't mean some of them don't have good ideas and some aren't a little better than the other, but they're all professional politicians. They bore me. The debates are going to be interesting. All anyone's going to watch it for Thursday night is to see what Trump says and to see who tries to trip him up and how that slime bag Chris Walachensky uh, tries to throw him a curveball. That's all. It's all the the theater, but it's not that interesting to me. There was a time that I lived to travel the green planet. There was a time I lived not just to travel, to go to a resort somewhere and lay in a hotel room and, and drink and walk around and take a swim. I never did that. I couldn't stand it. So I spent many, many years in some of the remote, most remote rainforests, or you call them jungles, in the world, collecting medicinal plants. And I'm very happy that I did that. And I'm very happy I created a body of work that has some meaning. Fine, I don't want to do that anymore. 
In my status in life right now, I could do that all over again. You know that I could fund 10 researchers to go out and do what I used to do? I can find 10 young researchers to do it? I'm not even interested in it anymore. Would you believe it? So I like certain things in my life, but none of them are really related to talk radio when you think about it. I like cars, but does that make for a show to talk about old cars? Uh, I like my dog. Is that something to talk about on the radio? I want to talk about my dog. Why should I do that? It's not your business. I mean, talk about it comes up once in a while. So what I'm asking myself the same question I'm asking you. What is my inspiration? What is to keep me going? Why should I continue on talk radio? How about making it very personal? Let's take it from my first question of what keeps you going to why should I keep going? Why do you want me on the radio? What do you want me to do for you? I'm not going to get up here and make a fool of myself every day and tell you stupid jokes about meatballs and bad Italian restaurants or good Italian restaurants. What is your inspiration? What is my inspiration? What keeps you going on? Where is your inspiration supposed to come from? Does anyone even care what happens tomorrow? Do you have a raison d'etre, as the French would say? Do you have a reason to live? Have you thrown this burden on other people? Have you turned to your husband or your wife and said, you give me a reason to live? See, when you have young children, I got to tell you, they are the reason to live. Everything else disappears. That is the greatest reason to have children in the world is the fact that they give you a reason to live. Did you know that? And God made it that way. God set it up so that man is supposed to be incomplete until he is married and then when he is married, he's supposed to have children. Laugh if you will. You're not supposed to throw the fetus into a garbage can or worse yet, turn it over to monsters like boxers, friends that plan uh, infanticide to chop up the body parts and sell them. Those, n those Nazi ghouls, if I had the power, I'd throw them all into jail. I would try them for homicide, every last one of them. So uh, if you have children, you have a reason to live. They are your reason to live. You have hope for them. You have a dream for them. You want to protect them. You want to turn them into something. You hope to God they become something, right? But what happens if God is silent? What if God left the theater? What if God has left the theater and he's no longer here? Not that God is dead. He just left this universe. He gave up on man. Maybe he said, I had enough after World War I. It was enough. I just can't take it anymore. And he said, goodbye, Work it out amongst yourselves. I'll be back in about a million years. Okay, so I'll be back in about six minutes. Be here. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. I'll turn this off. This is insufferable. It feels like dental work. God in heaven, what a bad song. Really, it felt like having a tooth implant. Anyway, I'm talking about what is your inspiration. I mean, if you're listening to the show for an hour, you say, where is he coming from? I love this guy, but what is he talking about? And I said to you that many of you once believed in the Republican Party, no more. Then the conservative movement, gone. You believed in your church, gone for many of you. You believed in religion, gone for many of you. Many of you don't even believe in God anymore. Many of you do, but what do you believe in? What keeps you going? Is it hedonism, Epicureanism, religion? Is it survival? You don't have time to, to analyze your navel as I'm doing? You say, come on, what's he talking about? I gotta drive a cab today, make a buck, or I don't pay my rent tonight. Or I don't sell enough Savlaki on the streets of New York. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna make a buck. I can't sell enough crack up here. How am I gonna make the payments? I can't get enough. Uh... Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. It is our number two of The Savage Nation. 
He realized to have want is to have something. To want nothing is to have nothing. And so he lived with his desire, feeling once again the desire for life itself. That is one of the lines from my experimental novel where I was exploring the same ideas I'm talking about today in a broader sense, which is what is your inspiration to go on? I don't think this is kind of the stuff you'd hear on an AM radio show. It's something maybe a philosophy teacher would have done in college, professor, you want to call him that, professing what I don't know anymore. But he would ask the students, let's talk about what keeps you going. Many of you are getting a lot of sex. When it, many of you are using drugs. They'd be, <laughs> They'd look at each other and squirm in their seat. Is that what you're living for, hedonism? What's your reason to live? One day, he would say to the students, you're going to need something more than just drug, sex, and rock and roll. Despite the constant push at that coming at you in every direction from American society, you're going to have to find reasons other than drug, sex, and rock and roll to go on. So what's going to keep you going? What is it going to be? For some greater good, you're going to go and save the whales. You're going to save the earth from global warming you're going to save the world from the evil republicans and you're going to follow the true you're going to become a true believer but why do you continue to struggle is the question i'm not i don't know i'm not addressing this to anyone in particular because i'm asking myself the same question and so now i do a jump cut scene two it's act two scene two a jump cut no transition crime and punishment dostoevsky and i found this note that i wrote Dostoevsky was not happy, but he was not born by the desire for happiness, nor did he test his own soul or the souls of others by their happiness or unhappiness. His faith in the soul was so great that he saw it independent of circumstance and almost independent of its own manifestation and action. Am I losing you? Is it too much for AM radio? I really don't know. For in these manifestations, there is always the alloy of circumstance or the passions of the flesh or of good or evil fortune. And he tried to see the soul free of this. He did not judge men by their di diversities, which outward things seemed to impose on them. For him, the soul itself was more real than all these diversities, and they only interested him for their power of revealing or obscuring it. Therefore, his object in his novels is to reveal the soul, not to pass any judgments upon men nor to tell us how they fare in this world. And this object makes his peculiar method. He shows man as tormented and mistranslated even to themselves. So we can see the reality beyond the torments and the mistranslations. His characters drift together and fall into long wayward conversations. I can go on and on. Why am I doing this right now? Why am I talking about your reason to go on, my reason to go on, what is your inspiration? Why am I referring to Dostoevsky? Where the heck is this coming from? What is Savage doing here? Well, I'll give you a couple of answers all at once. Hold on now. Hold on, just hold on. I have a couple of things always going, a couple of irons in the fire at any one time. That keeps me going, so I just finished, as you know, the promotion for the book, Countdown to Mecca. So now it's the summer, it's August, there's a slower time. And I'm on the cusp, to use a 60s phrase, I'm on the cusp of a new book coming out in October called Government Zero, which will be my last big commercial nonfiction book. It's a great book. Still waiting on the cover, even though I posed for it two weeks ago, still not out. It'll be out, it'll be a great book. But at the same time that I'm doing that, for the last year or so, I've had my journals from 1963 to 1969 typed and edited. And it's pretty hard looking back. And I found some pictures just two weeks ago of myself at college, 1962, 1964. And World Net Daily is publishing it as the Savage Diaries, Unprotected Thoughts from the Radical 60s. It's going to be an interesting book for those of you who want to know more about how I developed into who I am. And you'll see a picture on the cover of me sitting on the fender of an AC Bristol, a car, a, an amazing sports car. They're very rare. The headlight is taped with duct tape. <laughs> I look pretty funny in a tweed jacket, turtleneck, outside an apartment house in Queens, New York. 
Next to it is a picture of me walking around the campus of Queens College in an army jacket, 1962. I look pretty good. And I'm looking at this picture and I'm saying, is that really me? Because see, the first picture was of a poetic rendition of myself where I was in a completely different posture. And I said, no, no, you know, I, I really want to go with the rugged picture. So who am I? I'm asking myself, well, who am I? Who are you? Who is America? What is the world? Who is God? Who are, who are any of us? We're all diamonds and there are many facets of a diamond. So you decide which side of the diamond you want to look at at any one time, you'll get your answer of who the diamond is. And so I'm, I'm raising a philosophical question about what do you live for? And why do you live? And what keeps you going? And what is your inspiration? And I think it's an important question at a time like this where we're living in a new nihilism created by Bar Barack Obama, single-handedly destroyed America's heart and soul. He almost cut the heart out of this country. His, unre his relentless hatred, his relentless undermining, his relentless attacks upon every decent institution in the country, his nihilism, and he is a nihilist, by the way, his nihilism has infected the nation. He doesn't, even, he doesn't even pretend to carry a Bible on Sunday the way Clinton did. Remember Clinton had a, a Bible mocked up by his Hollywood friends? They made an oversized Bible with a cross on it so that he and Hillary could, could look like churchgoers when America still cared about God and church. Remember that? Clinton at least was a good actor. He was Caligula, but he was a good actor. This one doesn't even bother to act. He's gotten so far with not pretending that he figures why pretend? Just be what he is. Anyway, let's put him aside again for the minute. So I'm asking you, what keeps you going? What do you really believe in? Then I'm asking you another question at the same time. Why should I stay on the radio? I mean, I'm not leaving tomorrow. It's not like, oh, I'm going to leave tomorrow unless you give me a reason to stay on. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing one of those. But I'm really asking you the bigger question. My career one day will end. Whether it's a year or two years from now, after the election in 2016, I'll hang up the microphone and never be heard from again. Or I'll do a smaller show, I'll do once a week, or I'll do uh, an internet show. I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll do nothing. Maybe I'll be dead by then. Who knows what's going to happen, right? Do you really know? Do you really know what tomorrow will bring? I don't. We all like to think we're eternal and immortal, and we go on as though we're eternal and immortal, but we know behind, behind it all we know we're not. So as I'm looking back, you know, uh, hey, it says don't look back. The Bible warned us don't look back or you'll turn to a pillar of salt. Maybe I've turned into a pillar of salt. Just by asking these questions, maybe it indicates I am now a pillar of salt because I dared look back. And maybe I shouldn't have looked back. Maybe I should not have looked back and found those pictures from the 60s. I ask myself, but then I say, that can't. That really means nothing to me because I've written other books where I've looked back farther than the 60s. Didn't I write books about my childhood in my father's antique store? It didn't stop me then from going on. So that can't be it. Just looking back doesn't turn you into a pillar of salt. So the question is, for you, America, for me, Ameri the American audience, and for me, Michael Savage, where do we go from here? We need a clean slate. Professor takes out the eraser. The professor goes to the blackboard. And all year long, he's been... Or every month, you can see January, February, March, April, May, June, July, and he has all of the subjects that he's covered. And he says, look, we're in summer school now. It's August. Here's what I'm going to do today. I'm taking the eraser, and I'm going to erase January, February, March, April, May, June, July. So the blackboard is now empty. I've just cleaned the board. It's August in the Savage Nation. It's a clean blackboard. It's going to be a new year for me come September and a new year for you come September. And I'm not going to do politics 24 hours a day. I won't do it. As important as borders, language, and culture have been for me and continue to be for me, that's not the only reason I live, my friends. And I don't think it's the only reason you live. Again, this is too esoteric for many of you. You're struggling with two, three jobs. You don't know where tomorrow's uh, rent's going to come from. You're struggling to get yourself into a better place in life where you can earn a better living and live in a better house and get a better car and better shoes. I get it. And that's an important motivation. Believe me, you're very lucky to have that motivation. Success is a stale finale, as Eugene O'Neill wrote. I, I alluded to that, that play, Long Day's Journey and Tonight by Eugene O'Neill in the last hour, where he wrote, success is a stale finale. The struggle is the only success. And what you don't realize and I heard this when I was young and struggling from 
all the successful men, they would look at me and say, you have no idea how lucky you are that you are struggling. One day you'll come to understand that. I swear to you. I had successful older men who were actually kind men say to me when I was struggling, uh, they'd say to me, you have no idea how lucky you are that you're still struggling. Because I, I didn't know what he was talking about. I mean, I wanted the fancy car and a greater apartment, right? I wanted the better clothing. I wanted the better vacation. I wanted to eat in better restaurants. But they had all of that and they had no appetite. Did you know that? Do you know how many rich men on this earth have no appetite? And so they continue in their hedonistic splurges. They chase men or they chase women. They get men and they get women and they're empty. They're empty, they're empty, they're empty. And so I ask you again, the audience, what is your inspiration? What keeps you going? So I've been on the radio today for 75 minutes in this early week of August. And I know that many of you are fascinated by this discussion. For some reason, you're listening. Don't assume there's a blank board. I've had full calls from the minute I started this, which is very unusual. I got to tell you something. You ask anybody in radio and you listen to the callers, they're, they're like not there anymore. You're getting the same repeat callers with the same kind of boring statements. Today is a different day. This board is hopping. People are dying to talk philosophy. People are dying to discuss what's on their heart. And so I would say to you, if you can't want, join the conversation, you can't. You can't. But I'm going to take calls when I come back on this issue of what keeps you going. Excuse me, what keeps you going? What is your inspiration? Because why do you keep struggling? What are you struggling for? Tell me what you're struggling for. And again, I want to go back to some of the literature that's kept me going, like Crime and Punishment. And my dreams have kept me going. And I wrote about the American, the coming American Civil War. And I said that the United States is now in a war of words, a war of ideas, which inevitably will lead to violence. The rapes that are epidemic, the murders that are epidemic, the killing of cops that is epidemic, the robberies that is epidemic are an indicator. The infrastructure is crumbling in America. The government Goliath grows larger and larger while the work ethic diminishes, diminishes, diminishes. More and more people are on government assistance. Cheap labor is being imported, furthering the divide the divide between men, the divide between races, the divide between classes, also pointing to a civil war. And who is the orchestra leader of all of this discord? Who is living imperiously, stoking hatred and class warfare? I had a dream. I'm Michael Savage. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. What is your raison d'etre? What is your reason for living? Is it another person that you live for? Is it God? Where is God? Where has he been for a while? Was he uh, here during the Great Plague? Was he here during the, the Holocaust? Was he here during World War I, when nine million boys died for old man's, old man's vanity? Where was God in Iraq, when so many of our young men gave their lives for America and then were persecuted by George Bush with uh, military trials for doing their job too well by killing the terrorists? Where's God? Where's, where's, where's decency anymore? When the people don't know which way is up. There's no compass anymore. There's no leadership. See, a leader gives you direction. That's what a leader does. A leader gives you direction. A leader says, this is north, and we're heading northeast. Go. That's what people are looking for. Instead, they have a man in the White House who leads us astray, attacks every institution of decency leaves Christians from Syria in a holding camp and won't let them into America while flooding America with Muslims. People say this can't be true. It is true. There are Christian families right now sitting in a internment camp who have escaped Syria, and your president, your president will not let them become citizens while he floods America with Muslims. And you say, how could this be? How is this even possible? A soldier, a Marine, picks up a handgun that he carried on base against the law 
to protect himself because Bill Clinton disarmed all of our soldiers way back when. And lucky for us, he fired back at the Muslim in Chattanooga. He may be the one who killed him, by the way. No one knows. And the army is about to court-martial the Marine who shot back at the Muslim. You say this can't be true. It is true. It is true. It's all true. So people don't know which way to turn. They have no reason. They don't know what to do. The man who was normally patriotic and brave enough to become a cop doesn't want to become a cop anymore because the cops are now spit upon because of Obama and Al Sharpton and all of the haters. The guy who wanted to become a soldier doesn't want to become a soldier anymore. The person who wanted to believe in something takes a look at Barbara Boxer, perhaps the worst woman in the history of America, who glorifies the decimation of the unborn and the sale of their body parts and has the nerve to say it's for medical research. People can't believe this is going on and there's no consequence for any of it. So they're lost. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I myself am an American, as you can understand. I'm asking you, where is my inspiration supposed to come from? Because I'm not struggling for success anymore. See, here's the problem. I've hit all of the targets. All of them. Every one of them. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. 34 minutes after the hour. It's a weird day. I get it. It's August at the Hotel Savage. You want me to get excited over whether Meatloaf Jr. on Fox News is going to say something daring against Trump? What do I care? Make a moron of himself. He always was a lightweight. What do I care? He's the, he's the George Will of our time. Nobody. She thinks by shocking Donald Trump, he's going to earn points. With who? He's going to get invited to the White House? So yeah, I'm not going to get into it. After it happens, I'll get into it. So I'd rather talk about a little bit to do with some bigger thing for the human beings listening to this show, of whom there are quite a few, by the way. You look at the numbers, they're smaller than they were 10 years ago, but they're still very big. You see what I'm getting at? Others, they're comparatively small, but there's still a large audience for talk radio. Smaller than it was five years ago, but still pretty big, or else we wouldn't be in business at all. Anyway, so I'm asking you, what's your inspiration? What keeps you going? What, what makes you get up in the morning? Profit? Bottom line, new car, well, what is it? Next meal, next stop, next train, next plane. I know young men, all of whom own Gulf Streams somewhere. They compete with each other over who owns a newer Gulf Stream. Like we used to compete over who owns a better car. They compete over who owns a new Gulf Stream. Nothing wrong with that. I like it. I love Gulf Streams. They're a great airplane. Okay. You say, well, okay, great. So what am I talking about? What am I getting at? Inspiration. What is he talking about? What is he getting at? Why is he doing this to me? Why is he forcing me to think? What does he want from me? Why can't he just bash Obama more? I like that. Why can't he just tell us about how evil Barbara Boxer is with infanticide? Because you've heard it. That's why. And I've heard it. And I don't even want to talk about it. I'm uncomfortable doing it. Let someone else do it who likes to screech like Frito. And let that pass for conversation. I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about the plague of Islamism that is spreading across the planet that will kill all of us unless the plague is stopped. Did I say that? Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it again. I want to talk about the plague of Islamism that is spreading across the planet that unless the plague is stopped, we will all die from it. And again, I want to go back to a genius called Dostoevsky. Many of you have heard of Crime and Punishment, but you don't know that in the, at the end of Crime and Punishment, there's a passage when he's in the hospital, and he talks about a dream. And I'm going to read you his dream, Dostoevsky's dream. And then you interpret what he was talking about, a plague from the East. He was in the hospital from the middle of Lent until after Easter. When he was better, he remembered the dreams that he had had while he was feverish and delirious. He dreamt that the whole world was condemned to a terrible new strange plague that had come to Europe from the depths of Asia. All, would be, all were to be destroyed except a very few chosen. Some new sorts of microbes were attacking the bodies of men. But these microbes were endowed with intelligence and will. Men attacked, them by, men attacked by them became at once mad and furious. 
Moral conviction so infallible. Whole villages, whole towns and peoples went mad from the infection. All were excited and did not understand one another. Each thought that he alone had the truth and was wretched looking at the others. Beat himself on the breast, wept and wrung his hands. They did not know how to judge and could not agree what to consider evil and what good. They did not know whom to blame, whom to justify. Men killed each other in a sort of senseless spite. They gathered together in armies against one another. But even on the march, the armies would begin attacking each other. The ranks would be broken and the soldiers would fall on each other, stabbing and cutting, biting and devouring each other. The alarm bell was ringing all day long in the towns. Men rushed together, but why they were summoned and who was summoning them, no one knew. The most ordinary trades were abandoned because everyone proposed his own ideas, his own improvements, and they could not agree. The plague spread and moved further and further. Only a few men could be saved in the whole world. They were a pure chosen people, destined to found a new race and a new life, to renew and purify the earth. But no one had seen these men. No one had heard their words and their voices. Raskolnikov was worried that this senseless dream haunted his memory so miserably. The impression of this feverish delirium persisted so long. So that's from Dostoevsky about a plague from the East which uh, <laughs> for some reason strikes me as a little forewarning of about a number of plagues, including the current plague of Islamism. And I just, just, this just fell out, I swear to God, this just fell out of the book. This is old, because I didn't, I didn't talk about this book, Crime and Punishment, for about three years now. Two years? Wait a minute, I have the exact date. Here's an email. Okay, it's not the law. 6 one It's two years ago. I haven't picked it up for two years. Out of this book, Crime and Punishment, large print, from the Echo Library, I find this, Savage. I thought I could save America, but I was wrong. Dr. Savage looked back at his almost 20 years in the talk radio business and reflected on how much he and the country have changed. He always knew he'd be a successful broadcaster due to the work ethic that he still possesses. What Savage didn't expect was that he'd eventually lose the hope-filled idealism he started out with. Quote, if a person is going to listen to talk radio, they want value for their money, Savage told listeners as he explained his philosophy about talk radio. They want to feel like it was worth their time to turn that dial to your show. I've been in talk radio for X number of years now. I always knew I'd end up in the winner's circle, being ranked number one, two, or three. I don't care about the specific number. I must tell you, though, that everything I thought I, I stood for has come to nothing. When I began in talk radio in 1994, I was filled with hope. I thought we could save America from the liberal assault on our borders, language, and culture. But our schools, our military, and every other institution have been decimated. We have the most corrupt administration in history, seizing reporters' records, harassing their enemies. It's worse than the Nixon White House by far. The Obama administration makes Joseph McCarthy look like an angel. But because of the double standard, because of racial insensitivity, they're getting away with it. June of 13th. So here we sit two years later. It's gotten worse. And the maniac in the White House is tripling down now, going for the gold, seeing what he can do to decimate even more before he leaves office. So now, finally, 40 minutes into hour number two of the Savage Nation, after not taking a single phone call, I'm going to take my first call right now. Let's see what happens. I asked my audience, why should I keep going? And what is your inspiration? Let's go to Brian on WAAV in North Carolina. Brian, go ahead. You're up for the first one to, the first one to talk on today's show. What's on your mind, Brian? Uh, yes, sir. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Guardians of, or Rise of the Guardians, but much like them, I believe that you are a guardian of truth. And you should keep going. Thank you. I'm not going to, you know, use callers to create conversation just to fill airspace. WABC Sam. You're next up. Make your point. Hi. Um, I would like to bring out like this, that the purpose is just to enjoy yourself. You always heard it as enjoy yourself. It's not. It's enjoy yourself, who you are, your essence. You need to enjoy that. You can be busy with a ball or a radio station or a TV show and, and be busy your whole life with nothing, or you can enjoy something with substance, you, who you are. That's the purpose, to enjoy yourself. Now, what do you mean by enjoy yourself? What does that mean? So, 
it, it requires a lot of introspection, which I see today you're in a very deep mood. And, and you have to find out who you are, who your essential core, what your essential core is to know what you can enjoy about yourself. It, it's not external. It's not enjoying a movie or someone else's creativity, which is beautiful and, 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 and enticing. But that's not who you are. That's who they are. You need to enjoy mm-hmm. who you are. And, and I, I, let me, well, you, okay, so you're, you're a very deep person. What do you do to enjoy yourself? So I used to be in a heavy metal band. I've been on every drug. I've had naked girls in my in my apartment. I've had I've lived a life. I've noticed that it's all hollow. I became religious. That's that's how I found amazing, it. amazing, amazing. I knew this show would bring out the best in my audience. I knew I'd hear calls no one has heard before in, in radio, and I knew I'd get a caller like you somewhere in the midst of that wilderness of talk radio callers. I knew there'd be a gem like you. Please go on. <laughs> I'll say it like this: that I've discovered that life, itself, <laughs> life itself can only be found within God. God is associated to life. Come, you can store everything except for life. Everything has substance. I can store food from today to tomorrow. I can I can store oxygen. Oxygen, <laughs> you can have it in the tank. There's one thing you can store: life. Life comes directly from God. Understand God, you'll understand yourself. It's a process. It doesn't happen in a day. But but if you're willing to look for it, you'll find but it. Do you think? Do you think? Do you think that I, Michael Savage, don't know God? I think you are one of the deepest people I've heard. But I feel like I feel like you, I don't no, know. Today, no, today I'm going through a different. No, today I'm going through. I don't want to talk over you, but today I'm going through a little uh, spring cleaning, so to speak. But here's the thing: remember, a number of uh, 1990, I don't know, 20 years ago, I was going through a phase of what's the reason. Da 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 da. I met a very mystical religious teacher, and I sat with him one summer day, not knowing if I wanted to go on, let alone whether I could go on or what the reason would to go on. I just didn't know if I wanted to go on. You know that all of us have the power to literally start the process of dying in ourselves at any time. Do you realize that? It's a terrible process. No, do you did you do you agree with me that any one of us listening to this show has the power to will ourselves healthy or will ourselves sick at almost any moment? Sure, the placebo effect is a proof of that. Okay, good. So we all agree. I'm an extremely strong-minded person and I have willed myself to succeed. I've willed myself to keep myself healthy and it's worked, but about Reached a hiatus 25 years ago, spoke to the religious man, sat on that hot summer day, didn't even want to eat. And he looked at me and he saw something in my eyes, a spark. And he said to me, Michael, if you learn, if, if, if you, if you find God is what he said to me, you can literally move mountains. Shortly thereafter, I wound up in radio quite by chance through very, very, odd circumstances actually when you think about it and so you would say that i moved mountains wouldn't you or god moved the mountain for me but is that the point then it's, uh, let's just say 20 years I, I don't know i don't know what is the point no what is the point now it's 21 years later in radio so where do i go for the next x years do i keep doing the same thing hammering about the evils of society and talking about the wonders of the the people who are going to save us what's the whole point of this if you if you've just told me where you've gotten your inspiration to get into radio and then get that that passion and go back go back to your rabbi and have that deep conversation again and and, and find yourself again no, i had an argument with him i haven't talked to him in 20 years and that's the way i am it's like the same with restaurants it's like i i have arguments with everybody and then no, i don't go back well it, <laughs> it's a funny th- no it's a funny thing about me i'm argumentative and if someone insults me or i feel i'm insulted or i don't like what they do i don't talk to them ever again right right, right. It's a defensive mechanism, but, but everyone has one. No, it isn't a defensive mechanism. It's a way of staying away from boring people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear more about you as a heavy metal. You were a heavy metal uh, band member? or what? You don't have to divulge your name or anything. You played in a band or what? Uh, me and the group. Uh, the name of the band was Lucky Sixes. And uh, we broke up. Uh, <laughs> serious drug problems. The guitarist started stealing money and eventually stole other people's guitars to, to sell for drugs. It, it, became, it became very obvious that... that and where, where are you located? In, in New York? I'm upstate New York right now, yeah. No, but were you ever? Did you ever play in the city? Yeah, yeah, we played gigs all over, all over. The, oh yeah, yeah. The, the most all right, so you reached the point. You had all the girls, all the sex, all the drugs, all the rock and roll, and it was empty. Then you discover God, and 
How does that work for you now? What do you do? Do you talk to God every day? Um, yeah, but I, but but I, I learned that the Torah is is in a way it's like a game. In a way, we're searching for the same thing. The, the Western culture is looking for for that game, uh, a ball, right? What, what do you do with a ball? Right? The worst is soccer. You kick it back and forth and back and forth and back. And the worst is they, they have the chutzpah to call it a goal, right? You get it in the goal. What's the goal? What's the goal? How, how rude is it, is it to call it a goal? What are you doing with the ball? Nothing. It's emptiness. Right? If you well, find me, have you have you ever have you ever written Camus? Have you ever read Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus? No, I did not. Okay, wait. It, it's a it's a myth. It's a novel based upon the myth of Sisyphus, a Greek myth, where uh, an individual pushes a large boulder up a mountain all day long, struggles to push that boulder to the top of a mountain, struggles, struggles. He gets it to the top of the mountain only to see it roll down the other side, and then he has to go down to that side and push it back up the mountain only to see it roll down the other side. That's his eternal curse. He has to do that for the rest of eternity. He's punished in that way. That's the myth of Sisyphus. Is that what you're talking about? In, in a way, can I ask you this? Let me ask you, before creation, what what was God doing for so many years? So many years, there's just nothing in existence. What was he doing during that time? So I heard an answer that he was just enjoying himself. He was enjoying himself. Creation, why that is, we, we can we can philosophize for a thousand years of why God decided to create, if he was perfectly... I, I, w I will answer you in God's words with one sentence. Are you ready for the answer? Let me hear it, please. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's the answer. I don't have an answer for before that. And those who think that there is no God, and those who think that they're so smart because they don't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Moses, and those who think that they're so smart because they laugh at churchgoers, and those who think they're so smart because they laugh at the rabbis in the black coats, tell me what, the, what motivates them every day. What keeps them going? You were in that world. Tell me what motivates them. What impels them? What keeps the wise guys going? I, wanna, I want your answer on that. I'd like to know what's inside their souls. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. So Obama and his evil band of atheists and socialists <clears throat> have so cut out the heart of the military, banning and banishing Christianity, Christian prayers, that you ask yourself what would motivate a soldier to go into a hail of machine gun bullets or go on a bombing mission. They've cut God out of the military, these evil, evil university sorority types. I remember being in uh, elementary school and I'd hear this prayer didn't offend me, and yet there are people who won't let them pray in schools, even on their own, in private. It's just like, it's just like uh, the Soviet Union, where they banished religion. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Do you remember that? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. I would hear that in elementary school, and it would scare me to death. And then I would be inspired to realize that there's a God above who protects us all. And now the vermin have taken that away. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Anyone ever hear a talk show like this? When? Where? I don't know. Just creating something new for you. So here we are, and for two hours now, I've done something unusual I've asked you what's your inspiration what keeps you going why do you continue to struggle and, and the reason I'm asking you that is because my sense tells me that many of you are floundering you have no faith in the, certainly no faith in the president because you know that he's working for the other side your, your guts tell you that when has he last come out and inspired you tell me the last thing Obama's done to inspire you 
to come out of yourself for any reason? Why is it he always inspires the criminals and the bad guys? Tell me why. Why has he done nothing to stop ISIS? Why has he lauded the uh, street thugs in Ferguson and attacked the police? Did he come out and say one word about the hero cop, the white cop who was just killed in Memphis by a black thug? Did he come out and say white lives matter? Did he come out and say, I want the killing of cops stopped? Did he come out and say one word? No. You don't know which side he's on yet, do you? You'll figure it out. And so the evil that emanates from this man is so powerful. Make no mistake about it. He is not only occupying the most powerful office in the world, he himself is a very powerful man. Many of you made the mistake of saying, oh, he reads a teleprompter. Oh, he's not really smart. You are all so wrong. I warned you you were wrong. And I said, for, for many of you, once it was the Republican Party, then it was the conservative movement. Yeah, right. And some of you fall back upon the myth of the founding fathers or this or that. Do what you want that keeps you going. It doesn't matter to me. Some of you still believe in God. Some believe in the church. Some believe in religion. But where are the heroes? Who are they? They're certainly not in politics. So I ask you, well, what keeps you going? Is it great art? Nah, come on, in America? Even art has become nothing but an investment. There's no mention of art for art's sake. It's all about an investment. This Picasso sold for 30 million. That one's, this Warhol sold for 60 million. This is what we become, that debased as a society? Then no, no mention even of the art itself. It's like, what it's, oh, look at that Chagall what it went for. So no, that doesn't work. Hedonism, that works. Drug, sex, and rock and roll, that works for some for a while. I don't know how old men do this forever. I don't get it. There's a lot of old guys, even Bill Clinton apparently, who uh, is still driven in that way. I, I hear about it in L.A. too. 75-year-olds, 80-year-olds going on these missions to uh, foreign countries for sex. Have you heard about it or not? You don't hear about these things. They don't make it to the media. Bags full of Viagra waiting for them. Great art, hedonism, epicureanism, religion, pure thought. What do you live for? Then I ask yourself, I ask you, help me, tell me why I should go on. Remember I told you that for many years, I'll come out of it, I go in and out of these phases, and, and I'm just into one of my phases of questioning, that's all. I, and I appreciate you coming along with me, because I'm not going to talk about the rest of the uh, the news. You can get that anywhere. You to, to Click on the Drudge Report. In three minutes, you have the news. I don't think you understand that the whole business has changed with the Internet. It, it's so prevalent, and who has to listen to someone read the news to them like they discovered it? I love, they read a news story linked on Drudge like they wrote it. They read it to you. The guy sits and reads for five minutes. Like, you can't read for yourself. You lost the ability. You don't know the alphabet. They sit and read what the bright part has on the thing. That, 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 that passes for talk radio. Talk radio, the essence of it is talk. The essence of talk radio is talk. It's not reading news stories from, from, uh, from, the, from the Internet. And what does talk mean? Conversation. Talk radio is about conversation. Converse with verse. As one of my great teachers taught me, the art of conversation is to keep the conversation going. Did you know that? It's not to stop the other man dead in his tracks with one-liners. You're not Henny Youngman. The object is not to shut the other man up. The object is to, is to open the other man up. Not to shut him up. It's to open him up. The art of conversation, converse with verse. So today I'm trying to inspire you to think about what keeps you going, to keep the conversation going. And that opens our number three on the Savage Nation. And I'm being inspired by a number of things looking back, not turning to a pillar of salt. I told you that uh, in October, Hachette is publishing the great book, Government Zero. It's a huge book. Then comes the Savage Diaries from World Net Daily, Unprotected Thoughts from the Radical 60s with my journals, which are pretty revealing. Stuff in there that you'll never believe about me. But I want to I want to pause there for a minute because I'll tell you how, how I got here today. I have a friend who actually I went to college with. He was about a year behind me, two years behind me. And he lives near me a mile away, but we, we lost contact with each other. We didn't. He was very liberal. Let's put it the that way. And I didn't want much to do with him. And um, he didn't want much to do with me, I suppose. But it didn't matter. We went our own ways. Well, recently we got, we got sort of together again. He knew my mother, he knew my father, he knew my whole family. Was in my house when I was young. 
ate at my mother's table. So he came over this last weekend, and he thought he had a fatal disease. And it turns out he didn't, thank God. But he was really reflecting on his life, and he wanted to tell me how much he admired me all my life. And he tried to tell me that when I was a youngster in college, I entered college at 20, I think, or something. I graduated high school at 16. I don't remember. I, I stayed back a year in college to run my father's store. I lost a year there. I, I don't know when. was it 2021. Uh, he knew me then. So I showed him some of the pictures from the journals, and we talked about that time. I said, what do you remember about me? What do you remember about me? Who was I? He said, well, you were always the funniest guy in the crowd. You always had the guys rolling with laughter. You'd keep them going. He said, but you thought you had to be a comedian. You didn't know that we really were listening to you because of your wisdom. You had no idea how smart you were. And he said, you are, were always the leader of us. And we were awed by the depth of, of your thinking. Remember when he said, do you remember when you fell in love with Martin Buber, I and thou? I said, no. He said, no, you don't remember talking about it? You'd come over with your eyes burning with enthusiasm about I and thou by Buber. And you wrote an essay on it. And there's a funny story attached to that. I got an A in it in one of the classes and I gave it to someone uh, who was behind me in college by four years or so. And that person got an A in it with her name on it. She then passed it on to others. I heard it was the most passed around philosophy paper at Queens College, and it was all mine. They were all getting A's on my paper. <laughs> Today, they probably even know who Martin Buber is. They know who Jay-Z is and, what, and a rapper. That, that's how far we've fallen. That's what they teach now in philosophy, the philosophy of the gutter. So anyway, so you tell me, you, you're always into something. You're always into thought, thinking, leading us with thought. Always talking about philosophy. We were, we were knocked out by it. You led us. I said, I had no idea. He said, that's what I'm trying to tell you. You didn't understand that. So I said, would you do me a favor? Would you record your uh, reflections or memories of me? Just a short version. So we're going to do that in the near future. But at the same time, I'm looking back. At the same time, I'm wrapping up, wrapping up the show. And I'm asking myself, what does tomorrow bring? What is America going to be in a few more years of this monster? Can this country survive even less than two years of this monster? He is flooding America with Muslims, most of whom are not vetted. And he has Christians who escaped Syria's civil war who are sitting in an internment camp that he won't let into America. Just 20 Christian families. Why? Why is he flooding America with Muslims and won't let Christians in? Why are they going to court-martial a Marine who took out his own handgun and fired back at the Muslim, Abaduba Zabazabazad, a few weeks ago, who killed five. They're going to court-martial him for engaging the enemy? This is the world. It's an upside-down world. We have enemies, literal enemies of America running the country. Many of you won't say it. Many of you won't accept it because it could hit you right in the face and you wouldn't even accept it. They could get away with anything, as they are right now. They can get away with anything, and they are. They're getting away with virtual anything, and you don't even see it for what it is. And I do. I see it for what it is. And I say it for what it is. And then we have an impotent, non-existent opposition party. Forget about the press. There is no press. It's just composed of complete and total charlatans. You don't have to say any other words about it. We know who they are. So who's left? What's left? Do you understand what I'm saying? So let's take some calls. Steve, KCMO in St. Louis, Missouri, or Kansas City, wherever you're calling from. KCMO is a flamethrower in the Midwest. What's on your mind, Steve? Michael, I have a radio show here in Kansas City, and I use your clips every time I'm on the air. I consider you to be a modern-day Isaiah, preaching to the Jews and also to the Gentiles. But the thing that, that you come on the air to do, is that, and that is to share the truth and to expose the truth. But the reason you can't leave the air is because you're not done yet. You know, they say the truth will set you free. But sometimes the truth is so painful, so devastating, so debilitating, it's difficult. You're and right about that, my friend. I've compared myself to an oncologist who thought he could keep the patient alive. And then one day he opens the patient up and the cancer has spread so far that he sews the patient up and he just walks away from the, from the case. Exactly. Now, I don't know that we're there yet. 
But let me ask you a more telling question, Steve. First of all, thank you for calling. But uh, how do we know when it's our time to move on? Michael, you're not done yet. You, you know something? You're holding back. You know the truth, and you are holding back, and it is killing you. Well, what truth is it that you're talking about? Uh, wait, uh, a political truth? What truth are we talking about? Michael, who is it that is behind this conspiracy? Who is it that is driving this conspiracy? Who is, where are the funds coming for this conspiracy? Who is behind Barack Obama? And who are their alliances? You know all of it, Mike. Well, okay, let, let's put the pieces together. Where did this pope come from? Where did this Antichrist pope come from? How did they select the first non-European pope in 1,200 years who espouses naked Marxism with pure lies? How does he get away with it? Where they, who, who found this guy, this bouncer from Argentina and made him into a pope to begin with? And number two, when in the history of America have we ever invited a religious figure like this to speak to a nation that believes in a separation of church and state? And where the hell are the leftists who attacked Christianity every day of their lives. Now suddenly they embrace this Christian Pope. Why are they embracing him? Because he's not a Christian Pope. He is the anti-Christian Pope. Any other questions? Michael, who are these anti-Christ people? Who are they? That well, I don't know who they are. I never met them personally. I can pretty much guess who they are. You come up with words like the Bilderbergs, say like, okay, that's a place. It's not a person. But they certainly fit the bill. You come up with a man like George Soros, who you'll notice was very vocal uh, when Bush was in power, and he's been invisible since his puppet Obama has been put in power. Is that correct? That's right. You're getting there. Bro. When have you last heard George Soros or one of his in incompetent, impotent sons give a, give a talk recently? Never. Where are they? Well, th those fit the bill, don't they? Michael, who is it that's running Hollywood? Who's running the propaganda in this country? You know okay, I, when I say Geffen and I say Spielberg and I say Katzenberg, do you think I don't know who they are? That's right. And who is it that runs banking? Who is it that, what did, what did Paul Warburg do when he came to the United States to set up the Federal Reserve Bank, Mike? You know All who, right, my but, friend. Well, I don't, I don't know who they are, but I think that you, don't, you know more about it than I do. It sounds like I should listen to your radio show. What's the name of your show on KCMO? Michael, you're the one that's telling me, and I'm not. <laughs> no, no, now we're playing. We're playing a seesaw. Please tell the audience the name of your show. I want them to tune you in. What's the name of your show? I'm on KCX. My, you know, I probably a competitor. All right, my friend. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Here's a day. I got to tell you. Yesterday was like a hard sledding. We were hitting rocks in the third hour. Right now. I'm in hour number three of the Savage Nation. I've taken one or two calls. I have enough energy to go until midnight tonight. I could pull a Fidel Castro on you. I could speak until round about midnight. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. So the last caller said that I'm the, the Isaiah of radio, and another caller emails me and says, I want you to become the Moses of radio. I want you to part the Red Seas and show America the way. You're in, in, and uh, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. Hey, Isaiah, your land, strangers devour it in your presence. Your land, strangers devoured in your presence. That's Obama flooding America with strangers. And they will devour your borders, language, and culture right in front of your eyes, and you can't do anything about it. He has nullified, he has paralyzed the nation to defend itself. It is like an invading disease. It's very much along the lines of an autoimmune disease that has infected the body that starts to feed upon itself and kill itself, attacking its own defense cells. That's what this administration is. It's an autoimmune disease. They've attacked the police. They've attacked the military. They've attacked the true priesthood. They've attacked all of those of, amongst us who know what's going on and try to get the people motivated to defend themselves and make us the enemy when we are actually the people who can save you. So Isaiah wrote the same thing way back when. 
And he saw what was going on in his days in Jerusalem. He had a vision. And he, he stood up and he tried to speak. And they rebelled against God. And he wrote, oh, sinful nation, people laden with iniquity. N many of you stop right there. You don't want to hear any preaching and any moralism. That's not allowed. It's not allowed in the churches, in the synagogues. You can't talk about that. It's all jokes. <laughs> a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that deal corruptly. They have forsaken God. They have condemned the Holy One of Israel. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Does that, does that work for you or not? Too moralistic? Not John Stewart enough? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. So we're talking about where does inspiration come from? Where is it coming for you? Is it coming from the charlatan in the White House who has not yet cast off the garment that camouflages the true self? <clears throat> How much more of it can we take? Where is it going to end? Persecuting Christians, persecuting white policemen, never saying a word when police are killed, but talking about when thugs are killed. Persecuting a U.S. Marine who pulled out his sidearm and fired against a Muslim who killed five. That's the military under the girls who are running the country. These insane, psychotic drug addicts who are running America, butchering babies in the womb and selling the body parts and calling it medical research. When Goebbels, uh, Goebbels' wife there, boxer, goes on and saying that it's all about women's health. Can you believe the country we're living in, how debased we are as a nation? And his soul cried out to them and he said, Sons of my ancient mother, you riders of the tides, ready I am to go. And my eagerness with sails full set awaits the wind. Of course, I'm quoting right now from Cahil Gibran, the prophet, which I read in college. It was a very popular book in college. I don't know if it's popular anymore. He was a Muslim, by the way. It's funny how in my day we actually looked up to Muslim writers before the madness of Wahhabism spread across the, 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 the world and perverted the religion and turned it into some militancy. And by the way, Wahhabism comes from Saudi Arabia, our great uh, allies. Our great allies, Saudi Arabia, the provider of the terrorists to the World Trade Center. So people were always seeking truth. And so Gahil Gibran was a Muslim writer, and he wrote this mythical story called The Prophet. And he wrote on love, and he wrote on marriage, and he wrote on children, and he wrote on giving, and he wrote on eating and drinking, on work, a simple book on joy and sorrow. Oh, did I remember that one, boy, when I was 18. Then a woman said, speak to us of joy and sorrow. Then he answered, your joy is your sorrow unmasked. And the self-same well from which your laughter rises was oftentimes filled with your tears. And how else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Is not the cup that holds your wine, the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven? And is it not the lute that soothes your spirit, the very wood that was hollowed with knives? When you are joyous, look deep into your heart and you shall find there's only that which has given you sorrow that is giving you joy. When you are sorrowful, look again in your heart and you shall see that in truth, you are weeping for that which has been your delight. Some of you say joy is greater than sorrow. And others say, no, sorrow is the greater. But I say unto you, they are inseparable. Together they come, and when one sits alone with you at your board, remember that the other is asleep upon your bed. Verily you are suspended like scales between your sorrow and your joy. Only when you are empty are you at standstill and balanced. When the treasure keeper lifts you to weigh his gold and his silver, needs must, you, needs must your joy or your sorrow rise or fall. That struck us in college, boy. We passed that one around. Because most of the guys were going in and out of girlfriends. <laughs> joy and sorrow was the same thing. Many of them were dating girls named Joy. No one dated a girl named Sorrow. I don't think that was a popular girl's name in my day. Anyway, you see what I'm getting at is that there's always been philosophy around in America, except now there is none. We have no philosophy. None. None. Katzenberg, Hatzenberg, Matzenberg, Ratzenberg, and Spielberg have destroyed philosophy, poetry, art, and science. They have given us mere entertainments. 
that replace, replace greatness with great spectacles. Great spectacles. They are great spectacles, the movies that they make, but there's no greatness there. And man's soul is craving greatness. Man's soul is seeking leadership more than I can ever describe to you. Yes, we have a drought in the West in America, but the greatest drought right now is the drought of leadership, the drought of hope. There is no hope in America, none whatsoever, none. The only hope that's out there is Donald Trump and God in heaven. He's a great guy, I love him. I think he'd be a good president, but for God's sakes, let's not turn him into Moses. I don't think he can part the Red Seas, you know. But I don't want to get too political right now. I really don't want to go there. I'm just trying to put it into another area right now. I'm trying to say to you, we need hope. We need inspiration. We don't have it. We don't have it no matter where we turn. And I, I wonder how the policeman gets up in the morning and puts on his body armor to go out and face the thugs where he's intimidated to defend himself for fear of being called upon a call before a Stalinist board of jackals in his hometown or home city. Jackals who will say he was wrong even if he was defending himself. I don't know how the soldier puts on his uniform every day and goes and fights for an America that no longer exists. An America without borders, an America without a language, an America without a culture, how can he fight for a nation like this? <laughs> People are desperate, desperate for a leader. They don't know where to turn, they don't see it. There's no opposition party. There's no one talking about anything inspiring to inspire the policeman or the soldier or the sailor or the Marine. Where's the inspiration? Why do they do it? What, for the pension? Do you think that they really all do it just for the pension? Are you that cynical? You actually believe that? You don't know about the great tradition of military families in America going back five generations or more. Military families going back generation after generation in this country. It's inherent. It's in their blood. I wrote about some of them in Countdown to Mecca, by the way. I'm not here to sell you a book, but I did. And it was they, the old guard military families who plotted in my novel, all fictional, of course, I don't know any, to blow up Mecca during a Hajj. Because they feel that by wiping out four million of the most fanatic, they would uh, stop the plague of Islam Islamism before it took over the whole world, before we were too weak to defend ourselves. Now, this plot comes to Jack by accident in Countdown to Mecca. Actually, the book is, is a work of pure genius. It's one of the greatest novels ever written. And, of course, it was not even known in San Francisco. It was not even mentioned because they're busy uh, uh, in other areas. So I set up the novel that way. How did Jack Hatfield, my hero, find out about this plot to blow up Mecca? Well, it's a long story. I don't want to give the plot away. But in it, I have a hooker and a, and a, and a clown. And they have something to do with the accidental discovery of this plot. And then Sammy is Jack's half-brother, a former U.S. Marine. He lives next to the hooker. And uh, they then become targeted by the generals because the generals find out that they overheard a key word that describes their plot. So I'm going to read you one page just for the heck of it. Page 16. For those of you who live in San Francisco, you'll see how I get my fun. See, when I get into these phases that I'm in right now, I know where I, I know how to come out of this. I've been in these phases many times before. I write my way out of them. That's how I do it. I've always written my way out of the hole. So I'm just getting ready to write something great. And I started it the other day and it got swallowed by the computer on Sunday night. And I still can't get AT&T. It's in one of my studios. I swear to God, it went into mail waiting to be saved. I couldn't even print it. And it was about Islamism versus the West. And it was pretty good. It was a good beginning. A lot of it can be found in Government Zero, but I want to read to you uh, another page to show you how I get even with the people that I think have ruined the world. So on page 16, it's Jack Hatfield, my hero, in Countdown to Mecca. And you'll see why the book has never been reviewed in San Francisco. Here's the page. Before going to the hotel for a press conference, Jack Hatfield walked around the park atop Russian Hill, the prime real estate location in the Gilded City. As he did, he wondered about exclusion, how the uber-liberal city leaders excluded all but their sycophants from any and all recognition. Jack had long ago accepted his status as an outcast and wore it as a measure of pride in a corrupt and soulless place. The top families were filled with whores, thieves, drug addicts, alcoholics, and sex maniacs. Of course, there was the petty family, living off the old man's oil fortune while espousing green nonsense 
cashing in on fraudulent solar contracts. Then there were the two politicians, one whose husband did deals with China that crossed the borderline of treason, and the other whose husband and son did land deals that violated zoning codes while appearing on the boards of other green groups. Then there was Mr. Berkowitz, one of the chief donors to socialist causes, the single largest recipient being the ACLU. Berkowitz's money was made by selling his savings and loan chain to a major bank just before the housing crash of 08. He made billions while the bank that bought his junk mortgages went under. Jack could only ask how a city, let, al let alone a nation, could survive with such abject thieves running the show. Now, of course, it's all fiction. It is not based upon any character, living or dead. I want you to know that. All of my characters, organizations, and events portrayed in this novel, Countdown to Mecca, or just described on The Savage Nation, are either the products of the author's imagination or are used fictionally. You understand that? Fictitiously, sorry. And so that's how uh, I, I write fiction. I make it all up. Because as you well know, our city leaders are the opposite of that. As you well know, our, our, our senators are sterling individuals. I mean, we have Barbara Boxer, one of the finest women in the world who was trying to defend uh, people who were only doing medical research from the vicious attacks being done by those who film them and edit uh, tapes. She, I mean, she's one of the greatest women in history. She's sort of like the Martha Washington of, of, of abortion. And so it's certainly not reference, referencing her. And Dianne Feinstein, one of the finest public servants the world has ever seen. What motivates her to get up every morning is simply the desire to help America. She's on one of the f highest committees in the land and doing everything she can around the clock to make sure that we're safe and we can sleep well at night. So don't assume that these are based upon real characters. They really aren't. I see that I'm running short of time. It's uh, 45 minutes after the hour. You're listening to The Savage Nation. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Then an old man, a keeper of an inn, said, Speak to us of eating and drinking. And he said, would that you could live on the fragrance of the earth and like an air plant be sustained by the light. But since you must kill to eat and rob the young of its mother's milk to quench your thirst, let it then be an act of worship and let your board stand an altar on which the pure and the innocent of forest and plain are sacrificed for that which is pure and still more innocent than many. When you kill a beast, say to him in your heart, by the same power that slays you, I too am slain and I too shall be consumed. For the law that delivered you into my hand shall deliver me into a mightier hand. Your blood and my blood is naught, but the sap that feeds the tree of heaven. And when you crush an apple with your teeth, say to it in your heart, your seeds shall live in my body, and the buds of your tomorrow shall blossom in my heart, and your fragrance shall be my breath, and together we shall rejoice through all the seasons. And in the autumn, when you gather the grapes of your vineyard for the winepress, say in your heart, I too am a vineyard, and my fruit shall be gathered for the winepress. And like new wine, I shall be kept in eternal vessels. And in winter, when you draw the wine, let there be in your heart a song for each cup. And let there be in the song a remembrance for the autumn days and for the vineyard and for the wine press. Again, I was reading from Cahil Gibran of Eating and Drinking. Something I read in college has just come back to me. This was very important and very beautiful to us at that time. And I ask myself, where are the poets that inspire today? Where are the philosophers who inspire today? Where are the musicians who lift up our hearts today? Where are the artists who draw our eyes to heaven? Where are the politicians who speak of great things who can bring America back to its greatness? Where, oh, where, oh, where? I keep asking myself every day. And so today, as the show comes to an end after three solid hours, I hope you've understood where I've come from and where I've gone, and I hope you've traveled this road today with me, these three hours, some of you for 15 minutes, and some of you for the full three hours. I know some of you have stayed from the beginning, some of you have just tuned in and you don't know what you're listening to. It's the Savage Nation, a national talk show, heard on many hundreds of stations, including the one you're listening to me on every day, this time uh, on your local station. And today I took a digression from the normal fare of politics to something else, asking you, uh, so I think, some questions that humans need to be asked every day, which is, 
What is your inspiration? What keeps you going? Why do you continue to struggle? And I've gotten some great calls, really great calls. And um, I think it will leave you with more to do on this subject. And as this debate begins tomorrow night, this circus tomorrow night, which is actually a mark of democracy, incidentally, don't mock it. It's actually the mark of a democracy when you have at least 10 candidates competing with each other for one position. And it's a mark of a dictatorship when you have one old hag and a few potential old men uh, from the uh, uh, rigid Soviet Union of the Democrat Party. I mean, don't, don't confuse things. It's the Republican Party, in this case, that's showing any signs of a democracy. The Democrats have long been a one-party system along the old Soviet model. And as the uh, dirigible called uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign falls to earth, they're actually floating the idea of these non-entities like Joe Biden, Al Gore. It's hard to believe that they're that desperate. Anyway, that's what we've been doing today. Tomorrow, God knows what mood I'll be in. Maybe I will have started my new book. Maybe I'll be able to. I just heard AT&T finished fixing the cables going into that location where my computer ate the, uh, the essay. And if I can retrieve it, I will. And maybe I'll open with that tomorrow. Maybe I won't. Maybe it'll be all about debate. Maybe it'll be all about uh, travels with Charlie or travels with Michael. But I do appreciate your traveling uh, with me today. And tomorrow is another day. The phone number here is 855-400-7282. We have time for one quick call. Liana on WABC. A minute or less. Go ahead, please. You'll be the last word today. Yes, I believe that at this point in your life, you don't need any outside gurus. You are your own teacher. You know enough to look within yourself and know what has to keep you going. And, you know, they say in Judaism, where there's life, there's hope. Where there's a lot of life in you and still in this country. I know it's the darkest hour, but you know what? You cannot lose hope. And you yourself just answered what you I hear you. Going. I hear you. Right. And tomorrow, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow is another day. And as we build our sand towers in politics, the ocean brings more sand to the shore. <laughs>